Good morning and uh, welcome to Quarantine University. Uh, today we're going to be doing an unknown case conference. Uh, it's the first time I tried this on Zoom and uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, I know that some people probably saw the indication that this was a test and uh, that's never appealing, uh, but uh, I admire you for coming today. And uh, just so you know, your answers are anonymous, so don't be embarrassed about uh, responding to the polls. Uh, all of these cases would have been uh, seen or something like them in the recent uh, series. So uh, this is meant to be a, uh, put some emphasis on uh, points that were made during those sessions. If you missed uh, some of them, not all of them, but most of them are posted on uh, YouTube under uh, Rad Physics Quarantine University. So let's start with the first case. Uh, this uh, patient, as you can see, has a prepontine mass. Uh, this is a 29-year-old. Uh, and uh, you can see that the mass occupies this prepontine space with displacement of the basilar artery. Here you can see it has this uh, clearly uh, extra axial contour attached to the clivus. And this is the post contrast scan. So we have a non enhancing uh, prepontine mass. Here's how it looked five years later. So I'm going to ask you what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? So take a minute to consider a reasonable differential for prepontine mass. And don't be uh, shy about this one. I can tell you this was a difficult case and uh, uh, was challenging uh, in every way for diagnosis. I think what I'll do throughout the uh, program, just so there's not a long lag, is I'll give you uh, about a minute of uh, time to answer and then we'll just press on with what we have. Last chance for anybody to answer. So it looks like we have a diagnosis here of epidermoid, chordoma, echordosis, uh, and uh, arachnoid cyst. Now, I can tell you that this was initially diagnosed as an epidermoid, but uh, on the five-year follow-up when it uh, appeared to have enlarged, uh, the patient went to surgery and this proved to be a chordoma. Now, I think that you can learn a lot from uh, the atypical cases. And so let's look back in this case. In the initial study, uh, and I think an epidermoid is certainly a reasonable diagnosis, although this beak pointing out here would seem a little bit unusual, but the non-enhancing quality of it is perfectly consistent. And on this upper image the, on the diffusion scan, it didn't have the typical restricted diffusion of an epidermoid. On the second series, it's a little bright on the T1-weighted scan, which you can see with epidermoids, so-called white epidermoids. But there's one feature that was seen on the follow-up scan. It was this erosion of the clivus. This would be distinctly unusual for a uh, epidermoid. And so this is a non-enhancing chordoma. Now, I think I alluded to that in our talk about the skull base but I want you to be aware that this is a possibility because uh, I can tell you that these are usually diagnosed as epidermoids. And so uh, they may or may not have bone destruction. I have a second case that has no bone destruction, but these are usually in young patients. This patient was 29. The other patient that we had was uh, 18. And the, uh, it was a third patient who was 14. So again, these tend to be younger patients. And again, these are usually misdiagnosed as epidermoids or echodosis. Uh, 
The reason I think uh, you could argue against equidosis, uh, uh, again, here would be the, was the growth rate. So if you have any doubt about these lesions, certainly follow-up is indicated. Very good, very good. I think that was a good start, and let's see what we have next. Oh, again, this is a case report, but there's a number of publications about this, talking about these atypical clavicordomas in an adolescent. The other feature to keep in mind about these tumors, these non-enhancing chordomas, is they tend to have a better prognosis than patients who have enhancing chordomas. So uh, after resection, these tend not to recur, and that's been our experience that these are, uh, have a, a somewhat different uh, trajectory. And I think, uh, supports the notion, which, which is one that I have embodied, I guess, is the idea that there is really not a separate diagnosis of equidosis and, and uh, chordoma, but it's really a continuum. So what you're really saying is there's mostly a chordoma, or you're saying this is mostly a notochord remnant. Let's look at case two now. This is an MR venogram, and uh, these are the source images here you can see in the maximum intensity reproduction, uh, reconstructions here, uh, and here you see the superior sagittal sinus has a different signal intensity than the transverse sinuses. Here, transverse sinus, superior sagittal sinus, cortical veins, the other sinus. So the question is, let's go to that. The question is, why do you think the transverse sinus has a higher signal intensity than the superior sagittal sinus on this 2D time of flight? So you have a minute to answer and you have a choice. This is due to in-plane flow. This is due to slow flow or occlusion, stenosis in the superior sagittal sinus, or is this due to transverse sinus thrombosis? And this is really shine through. And while you're, while you're considering this case, uh, even if you've answered already, I want you to think about how MR venography is performed at your institution if you're at a place where MR um, uh, vascular imaging is routinely done. What is the plane that is usually used for acquisition of MR venography? So we have almost a minute, last chance. And ending the poll. And you can see that the, this was a good uh, poll we had uh, with uh, most people, 87% saying in-plane flow, which is right. Now, the, now what's, what I want you to, to consider in this case is that this is unusual for venograms to be performed in the sagittal plane. Uh, we know that the maximum signal on 2D time of flight imaging is when the vessels are perpendicular to the plane of acquisition. This is why when you do cervical MRAs, looking at the carotid artery, you do them axially because the vessels, of course, flow from uh, inferior to superior when we're talking about the arteries. Now, most venography is done in the coronal plane. This happened to have been done in the sagittal plane, and this is something you need to be aware of, particularly when you're receiving scans from outside institutions where they may uh, use different techniques, or perhaps there was some reason this was ordered to be done in this fashion. But this is a bit unusual for a venogram, which is, I think, why uh, this appearance was, was striking, because we're not used to seeing it. What's more typical that you see on MR venography is that superior sagittal sinus looks bright in this segment, and then you lose signal in this segment, because with coronal imaging, this is the in-plane portion of the vessel. So the answer here. Uh, is time of flight uh, in plane flow. So again, um, uh, the transverse sinus is of higher signal intensity because the scan was acquired in sagittal, so the vessel was, was coursing perpendicular to the plane of section. 
Uh, if, you, if you have any interest or feel you need to learn more about this artifact, uh, I would encourage you to go to the Apple Bookstore, iBookstore, and you can download this book. It's free, uh, and it's, uh, you can visit, view it on your phone. It's interactive in the sense that you can scroll through the images, and it's called Top 10 MR Artifacts. This is one of the topics covered uh, in this review, but you'll learn other things. So again, I'd encourage you, if you have an interest in learning more about MR physics, just to go through this short uh, review, which may, for those of you that are taking exams, may help you. All right, here's case number three. We have a mass evident on the CT scan done without contrast. This is calcification at the periphery of the mass. It's generally of low attenuation. And if you were to put a cursor over the central portion of the mass, the Hounsfield unit measurement would be in the order of uh, minus seven to 10. Um, so uh, the first question I'll ask you is, do you think this is intraaxial or extraaxial? So do you think intraaxial or extraaxial? That is, is it arising from the brain or is it arising from outside of the brain? Again, don't be shy. Uh, we, uh, we're not keeping track of any answers and no one can see your answers, so. But this is an opportunity for you really to, for you to test your fund of knowledge. Now it's very important to make the correct determination of intraaxial or extraaxial, I believe, because it changes your differential. Uh, for example, if you think this is intraaxial, then you might be directed towards something like a oligodendroglioma or a ganglioglioma with a little calcification, maybe a cyst formation. If you think it's extraaxial, then you're, it's going to change your differential and you might think of things like, uh, well, for example, a cystic uh, meningioma, something of that sort. But let's see what this, what this turns out to be. So, very good. Uh, we, most people felt this was extraaxial, which is correct. And how can you tell it's extraaxial? Well, you can get a sense of that here. It has a broad dural attachment. There's no brain outside it. Uh, could this be extraaxial? Absolutely. Many times the origin of tumors can be difficult to establish uh, on imaging, but I think when you're dealing with a tumor that has a broad attachment to this, for example, the skull base here or the meninges, you should at least consider that it could be extraaxial. So it's better, I think, to say I'm not sure than to be sure and put it in the wrong compartment. The patient went on and had an MR scan. This is what it looked like on an MR. So this is the T1 weighted scan. This is the T2 weighted scan. This is the diffusion scan. So I'm going to ask you now, what do you think it is? Do you think this is an atypical meningioma? Do you think this is a glioblastoma, arachnoid cyst, epidermoid, or recent hemorrhage? When I say atypical meningioma, I don't mean necessarily that it's atypical histology, but atypical in imaging. And this includes cystic meningiomas uh, uh, and the like. Glioblastoma, certainly, uh, uh, if you think it's intraaxial, glial, some sort of glial tumor, maybe not glioblastoma, uh, should be on your list. Uh, the glial tumors are probably the most common uh, in the uh, intraaxial primary brain tumors. Although peripherally located, you would think about more like things like oligodendroglioma, which also can be calcified. And uh, the other one, usually peripheral, is the ganglioglioma or ganglia neuroma. These are tumors that tend to arise more in the gray matter or gray white junction rather than the glial tumors, which are more in the white matter. Arachnoid cyst is okay when you think about the attenuation of, uh, of that close to zero. So, Here's our answers, and 
very good. 64% uh, said this is an epidermoid. This is indeed an epidermoid that was resected. Uh, and what can we say about this being an epidermoid? Well, it has a few features that strongly argue for an epidermoid. It's not fat attenuation on the CT scan, which is what you would expect with an epidermoid, although it should be low signal intensity, and these are frequently mistaken for arachnoid cysts. MR imaging is extremely helpful because while you could say, well, maybe this is a complicated cyst with some hemorrhage in it, and that would be okay here, but it wouldn't be okay here. Uh, this very high signal intensity on the diffusion weighted imaging is very typical for uh, epidermoid. Uh, in fact, uh, when you're looking for recurrence or success of resection, the epidermoid scan can be very helpful. Now, again, while you could say, no, I, I think hemorrhage could look like this on the MR scan, and we know uh, hemorrhage can be uh, restricted on the diffusion scan, we also know it was low attenuation on the CT scan, which again would uh, put you out of the notion of acute hemorrhage. So this is a fairly typical epidermoid. Uh, and its location is entirely typical. Notice that it is in the paracellar location. Here's the quadrigeminal cistern. I know it looks like it's sort of in the inferior frontal region, but it's very close to the cellar region. And most of the, most of the epidermoids that you're going to see, uh, apart from the intradiploic ones that we saw the other week, uh, these uh, intra uh, uh, cranial epidermoids are usually in the CP angle cistern or in the paracellar location. So very good. This is a typical appearance of an epidermoid. Next case. Oh, this is the enhanced scan. And you can see it has a little rim enhancement, which is probably compaction of veins, perhaps. But epidermoids should not enhance centrally. And uh, Again, uh, the attenuation is right. Uh, diffusion usually provides a diagnosis on the MR. This is another case I just want to show you. This is a CP angle mass. And while you might think this is an arachnoid cyst based on the T1 and the T2 weighted scan, you notice on the flare scan, we don't get suppression here. And uh, here on the diffusion scan, again, this is a CP angle epidermoid. Again, e extra axial mass. These are slowly growing tumors, often can cause symptoms more largely due to compression, but just another example of an epidermoid now in the CP angle cistern. Here's our next case. You can see that there's a, this is a, a, a patient uh, who presents with headaches, and what they notice is that there's a cystic structure here with T2 prolongation surrounding it. Uh, this is post-contrast, of course, no enhancement. And this is the flare scan, and again, shows a little better the T2 prolongation around this cystic lesion. So you're, uh, you know, you're uh, on service, you get this case, and you have to decide now how uh, to uh, uh, report it. Are you gonna call this a possible low-grade primary brain tumor? Are you gonna call this a developmental venous anomaly? a giant perivascular space, or could this be a reflection of infection uh, with sister cirrhosis, particularly if you happen to live in the Southwest? And one other tumor I think you should, I'm gonna put on the list there is a, a D-nut. Uh, we talked about that in the epilepsy talk. Uh, the uh, uh, D-nuts uh, tend to have a cystic quality. Those are the disembryoplastic neuroectodermal tumors. So we'll take a few more seconds here. And I, I, I want to tell you I'm very pleased with the participation I'm getting today and uh, uh, sort of makes the effort of preparing these worthwhile. All right, so here we are, uh, and we're going to end the poll there, and let's see what we have here. So there's uh, some uh, um, spread of opinions here, low-grade uh, primary brain tumor, giant perivascular space, sister cirrhosis. Now, let's take these uh, separately. The patient doesn't really have any symptoms. 
And so uh, for a disembryoplastic neuroectodermal tumor, a low-grade primary brain tumor, uh, we're a little skeptical about that because uh, certainly the DNUTs tend to uh, present with uh, seizures, although you can argue that we're only finding them in patients who are symptomatic. But be that as it may, this happens to be a very typical appearance of a giant paravascular space in the anterior temporal lobe. Uh, for those of you that saw uh, Dr. Navavizida's uh, talk, and I touched on it briefly in the epilepsy talk, and so feel free to go back to those lectures on uh, YouTube. But uh, this is an entirely classic appearance of an anterior temporal lobe uh, perivascular space. The T2 prolation, which is unusual to see around giant perivascular spaces, for some reason, that certainly I don't know why, uh, you can see in the anterior temporal lobe. The absence of enhancement uh, certainly would take you away from the diagnosis of a DNUT and other uh, more aggressive uh, brain tumors. And in terms of developmental venous anomaly, we don't see the branching structures here. And, uh, and so the best diagnosis here is a giant perivascular space, even though it's a little unsettling. Uh, and I can tell you that the surgeons won't be too pleased with that one unless you show them the article. So uh, again, this is a typical appearance of a anterior temporal lobe giant perivascular space. Now, in your practice, if you're uncomfortable about that and just saying that's it, one and done, uh, no follow-up, I think very reasonable in a case like this to recommend to say I really strongly favor, as in you know, predicting the weather, like 80% confident this is a benign perivascular space, but maybe follow it in a year and just make sure it's stable because it should remain stable. But, but, but I think if you don't introduce the idea this is a normal variant, uh, and the patient is concerned when the, when, you know, of course they read the reports in the US, uh, they get the copy of the reports and they see the there's a possibility that you think this is a low grade neoplasm. There may be a push for biopsy, which I don't think is uh, indicated with this imaging. Uh, and again, uh, when in doubt, don't biopsy unless you see some atypical features such as an enhancing nodule. All right, here's our next case, case five. So we're, we're getting to halfway point here. And let's see. What I'm going to ask you in this case, look carefully at, uh, these are two different patients. Here's patient one, here's patient two. It's the same entity. So. Do you think this is a chondrosarcoma? Do you think this is a hemangioma of bone? Is this arrested pneumonization? Is this a chordoma? Or is this another case of echoidosis, which we know can be seen in the, in the skull base or near the skull base? So let's talk about these a little bit. Remember, just as a reminder, chondrosarcomas, these are malignant uh, tumors. They tend to arise off of the midline at the uh, uh, junction of the clivus and the petrous bone, sort of in this area here. Uh, they are, will have bone destruction. But again, there's a lot of variations in this and they, they can in many ways resemble chordomas. Hemangium of bone is, again, often has some internal structure. Uh, arrested pneumonization, we'll come back to that. Uh, chordomas are, should be some bone destruction. And necrodosis, again, we shouldn't have bone destruction, but usually not central skull base. So let's see what we have here. Most people, I think, uh, correctly indicated this is a case of arrested pneumonization. Uh, Again, uh, benign, we're pretty sure based on the sclerotic appearance, there's a little internal uh, structure. Now, again, in another bone, you might have favored a mangioma, but in this particular location, in the central skull base, the most likely diagnosis is arrested pneumonization. Now, in any event, if you called it a hemangioma in practice, uh, I don't think any real harm is done there. Uh, if you have a question, go to MR imaging. Arrested pneumonization should have some preserved fatty marrow. A mangioma will have a little different quality because 
uh, of the, you know, the quality of enhancement. And there are some atypical hemangiomas as well. But in, in any event, if you called it either of these, you're on the right track. This is a benign lesion, doesn't require biopsy. Again, if you're not comfortable, you want to follow it up. But, uh, but in the same way as I indicated uh, in the previous case, uh, better in cases like this to strongly suggest it's benign and go for follow-up than wishy-washy about it and have the patient uh, push uh, or the surgeon push uh, for a biopsy when it's really not needed. So again, arrested pneumatization, important normal variant to be aware of. Now we're going to go to our next case. So again, near the midline, there's some internal structure. These are not purely lytic. Now this is our next case. So this is a CT scan of two different patients. And here you see there's an expansile lesion in the skull. Uh, it's, this is expansile in the sense there's a soft tissue component which is bulging the skull a little bit here. But I want you to decide whether you think this is a cavernous hemangioma, metastatic disease, an intraosseous meningioma, a capillary hemangioma, e.g., which we know can frequently involve the skull, and or is this an arachnoid granulation? And you see, again, in this spread, we have uh, malignancies, uh, we have uh, completely normal variants, and then we have uh, uh, lesions that are, in a sense, benign, but still may require some uh, treatment. So uh, again, I think uh, it's important to, to, even when you don't exactly know the diagnosis, to be able to put it into the right category so that the correct treatment and follow-up decisions can be made. Last chance to answer. Okay, let's see what we have here. So, lead answer is cavernous hemangioma of the skull, which is what this represents. Uh, now, let's take a look at some of the other imaging. This is what it looks, this is what they look like on MR imaging. Do you see this kind of uh, starburst appearance, these lines radiating from the center, radiating from the center? This is a very characteristic. So this is a lesion that I put in that category of very typical appearance of a rare disease. But in, again, important to recognize these for what they are because they are, in a sense, uh, benign histologically, even though they're not necessarily benign to the patient. Uh, and uh, here again, this sort of starburst appearance you see on the enhancing study. These are hypervascular lesions, although not in the sense of uh, arterial venous shunting, but in the sense that these are large venous uh, uh, spaces and there's high flow going to these lesions. So it's something to consider in surgery. And as I indicated in my one experience with uh, surgery with one of these cases, we did preoperative embolization, which I do believe decreased um, the bleeding. I was there in the operating room when they took it out. So again, this is a cavernous hemangioma of bone uh, to be distinguished from a capillary hemangioma of bone, which is the more typical one that you see uh, that should not have a soft tissue component that you saw in this case. They're usually expansile. The ones I've seen have nearly all had the starburst appearance, although not all. They can enlarge over time. Now, this case seven, this is a, uh, was a challenging case, and I showed to you just uh, to sort of get your take on it. Uh, here's the enhanced CT scan. Here's the bone image from the same study. You can see there's some bone structures in here and some remodeling of the skull. 
Here's the MR scan. The patient actually had two lesions, had this lesion here in the posterior fossa and this lesion in the frontal lobe with considerable mass effect, pushing the falcs over or displacing it, midline structure. Now notice the pattern of enhancement of a lesion. And I'll show you one other image. This is the angiogram of the patient, which was obtained prior to uh, resection. So, not holding any cards in my sleeve. I'm showing you what we had. And uh, let's see what you think of this one. So, what's your diagnosis here? Is this a hemangioma? Is this an intradepoic epidermoid, meningioma, metastatic disease to the skull? And I spelled that wrong, but I meant to say chordoma. If you're having trouble with this one, don't feel alone because this was a very troublesome case, but I think it was, it's a good one to look at and, uh, and uh, I show it as an instructive case. Last chance to answer. Okay. So here's the results. Most people thought this was a meningioma and I think that's exactly reasonable. And this is what I think it was considered at the time of surgery. Now, why do we think it's a meningioma? The patient has a meningioma. So, you know, Occam's razor says that the simplest answer, simplest solution is uh, most often the best one. So the patient has one meningioma, why not have two meningiomas? And, um, and what's in favor of it being meningioma? Well, it certainly enhances homogeneously. We know it can have some bone changes, although this pattern of septation is a little unusual. The angiogram is odd. It's odd. You see these little tufts of enhancement here? For those of you that have seen angiograms of uh, patients with meningiomas, this is an unusual pattern of enhancement. And this proved to be a hemangioma, another hemangioma. Maybe uh, I think we might call it an aggressive hemangioma, but the pattern of this tough pattern of enhancement, these are these giant venous lakes. Uh, the enhanced MR is not entirely typical for meningioma. That's central pattern, pat this central area of non-enhancement kind of odd and very, as we know, hemangiomas tend to fill in from the periphery. Maybe if that image had been done, uh, five minutes later, maybe it would have looked more like a meningioma, but again, uh, uh, this was a difficult case and the diagnosis was only made at the time of surgery. So remember that Occam's razor, a law of parsimony, the simplest solution is the most likely the correct one. Remember, it says most likely, not always, and some patients will have two different diseases, and this, of course, what keeps the job really quite challenging. So Another variation of hemangioma, keep that in mind when you see unusual skull lesions. All right, that was case seven. We're getting towards the end of our unknown conference. Now, here's a patient, 50 some year old patient presents with acute symptoms, uh, completely healthy previously. And she comes in, she has this flare scan, which shows this lesion this lesion extending into the corpus callosum and this enhanced scan. So I'm gonna ask you what you think of this case. The patient was actually sent in for a biopsy. And so do you think the patient has PML? Do you think the patient has a primary high grade glial tumor? Do you think this could be tumefactive MS, a brain infarct, or variation of encephalitis. So PML, as we know, these patients tend to be immune compromised. Uh, 
I would say uh, very unusual to even consider PML in a patient who's not immune compromised. Although keep in mind that in patients with multiple sclerosis who are on immunomodulators, some more than others, have a propensity to get PML. So PML is a secondary demyelination is what we see on the imaging. It's a primary infection of the oligodendrocytes with a virus, JC virus. So uh, that one might put down on the list uh, because the patient, as far as we know, is not immune compromised. So generally diagnosis, 77% said tumefactive MS, which is the correct answer in this case. This patient actually got re-imaged uh, a week later, looked much worse, now bilateral involvement. Uh, treated with steroids, resolved completely. This patient, this is actually called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, but you know, difficult to distinguish from MS sometimes. Uh, this is a monophasic demyelinating disease, can be post-viral, maybe some sort of variety of vasculitis or immune-mediated uh, disease, uh, can have brain and spinal cord involvement. My experience tends to have a little more basal ganglion involvement than you expect for MS. Uh, usually responds to steroids and has a good recovery. This patient had a very good recovery with complete recovery of all the deficits. And spinal cord imaging can be helpful, particularly if you were thinking this was a tumor. Spinal cord can be helpful. This is what the patient looked in the second scan. This is what they look like four months later. At this point, they, their symptoms have completely resolved. So the feature that should allow you to suggest, as you did, uh, picked up on, uh, the pattern of enhancement is entirely typical for a tumefactive MS lesion. Also notice there's not a lot of mass effect on the ventricle. And the third thing is this lesion in the middle cerebellar peduncle is entirely typical for demyelinating disease. So actually whenever I see a lesion like this, a unilateral middle cerebellar peduncle lesion like this, my first thought is I'm dealing with MS. So uh, very good uh, analysis of that case. This is again, uh, uh, whether you call this uh, MS or you call it uh, ADEM, uh, we're in, certainly in the same uh, category of disease. Case nine, uh, close to the end. This is a, a child presents, has a seizure. He has a history of recent headaches and was on antibiotics for sinusitis. Based on just the CT scan, what is your diagnosis in this case? So do you think this is a subdural? Maybe the patient has some uh, uh, unreported trauma. Do you think this is an epidural abscess? Or do you think this is a frontal sinus mucosal, maybe from the patient's uh, uh, sinus disease? Give you a little bit of time to think about that. And I just want to point out this is in here you see the sinus disease or pacification of at least this portion that we see of the maxillary sinus on the right. The ethmoids are completely cl clouded. This is not bone. I'll tell you, this is not bone. So this is not part of the frontal sinus. Uh, and any more answers? No? Okay. So let's see what we have here. 80% got the correct diagnosis of epidural abscess. Now, if you're in doubt, get an MR scan. Here we go with the MR. Very typical appearance of an epidural abscess. High signal intensity, homogeneously on the diffusion weighted scan, just like we saw in uh, our uh, talk about infection in the intraaxial abscesses. Homogeneous, high signal intensity on diffusion, low signal intensity, even lower than most of the brain on the ADC map. And Here's the enhanced scan, kind of vigorous enhancement from inflammatory change. There's also enhancement in the subgaleal region. So this infection was actually inside the skull and outside the skull. So this is an epidural abscess. Again, very important diagnosis to make early on. Uh, not all the patients are going to have sinusitis. This was a pretty classic case. Sometimes they're on antibiotics if they're partially treated. Maybe they're on the wrong medication. Maybe they're not taking it properly. Maybe they're taking it now and then and they forget. 
But in any event, the presence, the fact they're on antibiotics does, should not dissuade you from the diagnosis of an epidural abscess. Uh, important to recognize because the mortality is actually quite high with untreated abscess. So you really must be uh, secure about that diagnosis and uh, recommend strongly uh, surgery. And let's see for our last case. So this patient presents with a, oh, excuse me one second. Uh, this patient presents with uh, uh, a central skull base mass. And here on the CT scan, you can see there's destruction of bone. Here you see it on the sagittal scan. Uh, again, destruction of bone here. So this is a, not a, necessarily an expansile lesion, but a lytic lesion of the skull base. This is what it looks like on the MR scan. This is the T2 weighted scan. This is the T1 weighted scan. And I'll tell you, it did enhance uh, to some degree. So I'm gonna ask you now, diagnosis, do you think this is a chordoma, a nasopharyngeal cancer, a sphenoid mucosal, or another variation of ecrodosis? Again, this is an important distinction to make uh, because, again, chordoma is a, uh, a primary uh, uh, tumor probably arising from notochord uh, remnants. Nasopharyngeal cancer, some of these patients will have predisposing uh, features. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, many of these uh, cancers uh, have been attributed to HPV uh, in this country. Uh, certainly a uh, higher proportion in other countries, uh, and uh, there is some propensity of nasopharyngeal cancer to occur in patients who work with wood, thought to be some formaldehyde, I think, preservative in the wood, but in any event, the history sometimes will help you. They often have some uh, risk factors uh, uh, as well uh, in terms of alcohol and smoking and so on. So, any last takers? Let's see what we have here. Nasopharyngeal cancer, most people said, which is absolutely right. That's what this proved to be. Uh, why do we know it's a nasopharyngeal cancer? Why do we suspect it? Mainly, I think, as you recognize, many of you recognize on the T2-weighted scan, the strong argument against uh, chordoma is the lack of uh, high signal intensity, fairly characteristic for chordomas. When you see that they're dark on the T2-weighted scan, I think it's very reasonable to say because you can't be entirely sure. Uh, this actually did, uh, ENT looked in the nasopharyngeal region, they didn't see anything abnormal, but on further testing of the biopsy and resection material, uh, there was EBV positive, and this felt to be a primary submucosal nasopharyngeal cancer. But metastatic disease is also in your differential, and again, you can sort that out with PET scanning and, and uh, other testing. So. Again, this is uh, uh, important to recognize as a malignancy based on its uh, destructive quality at the skull base. Uh, so nothing equidosis, uh, hemangioma about this. This is a lytic lesion at this case. Patient, uh, surprisingly, was not very symptomatic uh, uh, from this uh, uh, lesion. I think they came in with some difficulty swallowing. But uh, uh, important to recognize that this is an aggressive lesion and does require biopsy. We're, again, arguing against chordoma. So metastatic disease, I noticed I didn't give you a choice of metastatic disease, but I think that would have been entirely reasonable. This is nasopharyngeal cancer. So that's all I have uh, for today. I'll show you this just because I found this a wonderful story about King Tut's dagger, which was found in his wrappings and I think was just recently determined because it was something not right about the blade that this was a, a, of a iron base at a time that uh, iron refining, uh, refining had not been recognized in this <coughs> dagger from thousands, some thousand years BC. Uh, and this was felt to be, uh, had been made from a meteor fragment. <coughs> so, 
uh, just to how metal changes in value. We think iron is commonplace, but meteoric iron at that time was probably as precious or more precious than gold. A little trivia, the uh, summit of the Washington Monument, uh, I recall, was made out of aluminum because at the time that was considered a, a fairly precious metal. So thank you very much for uh, joining me this morning. Uh, I hope those cases were instructive for you. As, a, as I indicated, many, uh, not all of them, but many of them are uh, lesions that we've discussed in some recent sessions. So feel free to go back to that on uh, Rad Physics Quarantine University on YouTube. And uh, as I indicated, the, there's some free material that you can find on uh, iBooks that'll help you with the uh, physics. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, let's see what we have here in the, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, there was a question about uh, edema. I'm not sure which case that was. Uh, feel free to unmute your microphone and let me know. <laughs> 